Good morning. It's great to see everyone visiting, but it is time to get started this morning for our morning worship service. Uh, every Lord's Day at 10 a.m., we just finished up our Bible study. Uh, we have every Lord's Day at 9 a.m., and we'll have a 5 p.m. worship service again this evening. We also have Wednesday evening uh, Bible studies at 7 p.m. So want to welcome everyone here. We've got a lot out, probably traveling, and we've got a lot of visitors in our midst, and just know you're our honored guests, and we're, we're so grateful to have you with us. Um, we want to pray for those who are traveling, and a lot of times we say this at the end, but I'm going to say at the beginning that we want to be praying for our spiritually sick and those who may be struggling. Um, there's a lot that goes through people's minds this time of year. Um, you know, some people remembering losses. Uh, this can be a difficult time of year for some folks. It's joyous for some, but difficult for others. Maybe for some it's a little bit of both. So let's pray for those who may be struggling um, at this time of year, particularly with uh, maybe their, their spirituality, and let's do what we can for our brothers and sisters, or, or do what we can for those who may be not uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, and, and pray for them that something may be done for them so that they may make that ultimate decision in life and uh, come to know the Lord. We're also going to pray for our shut-ins. Um, let's pray for Sister, Dor Sister Dorothy Collison, um, Sister Linda McClure, who will have her follow-up visit for her cancer diagnosis on December 27th. I believe uh, Brother Mike said the one on the 20th got canceled for some reason. Um, also, let's pray for Sister Kay Rogers and uh, members who are sick and recovering. Uh, let's again pray for Brother Jeff Long and rejoice with him in the the benefits of his cataract surgery, the first of two, and pray that the second one goes as well as the first one did. Um, friends and family members who need our prayers, we're going to continue to pray for Christina's uh, long sister, Terry Jones, who's still awaiting a living uh, liver donor. For Hatley Rogers, the Branscombe's neighbor who's battling cancer. Uh, for Phyllis Hale's husband, um, who had the broken, uh, I believe it was a broken hip as a result of cancer. And so um, they're going to go back to Little Rock on the 18th of January to figure out where they go from here on that, uh, that diagnosis. Sister Linda Rose's brother, who is battling cancer. Uh, Sister Carmen Baxter's dad. John McPherson, as he battles uh, mantle cell lymphoma. John Shadowens, who's the former Caraway preacher who is battling dementia. Also, uh, Ruth, Milgram's, Ruth Milgram's grandmother, Kay Davis, who is the wife of Joe Davis and the mother of Jody Christenberry. Uh, Curtis Christenberry's dad, the Meade's son, Brother Ronnie Cossie's mother, Sue, Brenda Fasulo's mother, Sister Sheila Brogdon's brothers, Sheila Brogdon's friend, Kayla McIntyre, who is battling an aggressive form of brain cancer, and Sister Dawn Webb's dad. In the way of other announcements, we have a number who are sick this week from, from various ailments, and that would be uh, Brother Brandon Ward and Savannah, the Doyles, and Sister Amy Branscombe. So let's pray for all those, again, who are traveling right now or maybe traveling in the upcoming week. Um, there will be no Tuesday morning Bible class for the next two weeks as Brother Mike will, will be out of town. So no morning uh, Bible class on Tuesday mornings for the next two weeks. And then one last announcement um, is that the sign-up sheet for locking the building for 2024 will be in the back. So please sign a, a spot for that if you're willing to lock the building up for the upcoming year. Our order services today... Um, our song leader will be Brother Mark Webb, and that first song will be number 27 if you're going to use a hymnal, and it'll be on the screen behind us as well. The so first song is number 27. Our first prayer will be by, our opening prayer will be by Brother Jason Hart. The Lord's Supper reading will come from Brother Eric Branscombe, and that reading will come from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 4. Again, Isaiah 53, 3 through 4. Uh, the Lord's, uh, or the, excuse me, the prayer for the fruit of the vine will be brought to us by Brother Rick Martin. And the prayer for the contribution will be brought to us by Brother Todd Ashley. Our scripture reader this morning will be Brother Michael Milgram. And the scripture reading for that will be Psalm 
136, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 136, 1 through 4. And that our, uh, our closure prayer will be brought to us by Brother Ronnie Cossey. We'll begin our services at this time. pray. Dear Holy Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity we have, as, as well as many others around the world today. We have the opportunity to come and worship you, and we know that when we gather, you are present. We can worship the one and true living God, the opportunity to sing, to give, the opportunity to listen to another portion of thy word, that we can try to apply it, test it, and apply it to our everyday walks of life, that we may be an influence to ourselves, as well as our spouse, our children, as well as the people around us each and every day. May we be good stewards and good representatives of you. We know that we do fail on occasion, and we know that we're always working, a work in progress. So thankful for you that you're willing to give your son that the focus is that he gave his life for us, that we may have that opportunity and so thankful for the Holy Spirit to give us the word that we can choose to turn each and every day of our lives to continue to study. We're so thankful for the church as we are encouraging each other as well as when we leave our families that we have in churches around that can also encourage and uplift each other as Christians. We ask you to be with those that are sick, those that have lost loved ones, those of us each and every day that deal with our issues, that we can turn to you at any given time in prayer, that we have that opportunity to speak directly to you. So thankful for all the many things you give us each and every day, the ability to provide for our families, go out and work, and then also to give. Please be with us during the service. May we focus on the worship that we give to you, may it be pleasing that we examine ourselves each and every day, that we want to find ourselves true, that when that day comes, when the clouds roll back and the trumpet sounds, that we have that home in heaven with you someday. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. song this morning is going to be number 27, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. We'll sing the first and the last verse of this song. <clears throat> be on the overhead only the battle belongs to the Lord. We'll sing all three verses of this song. <clears throat> no longi in heavenly armor will enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapons that's 
fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in do not fear, the battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We For the Lord's Supper will be number 163, Night with Evan Pimmian. Sing all three verses.
Reading before the Lord's Supper this morning will be Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 4. That's Isaiah 53, 3 through 4. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. We will now offer thanks for the bread. Our most holy and righteous Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for another day that you have blessed us with. We pray now that you will bless this bread, which represents your son's body, that we may partake of it in a manner that is well-pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we ask, amen. Let's bow once again. Heavenly Father, we continue our thanks for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which we take in memory of, of the shed blood of our Lord and Savior. We pray, Heavenly Father, as we protect this cup, we will do so in a manner that I prescribed in thy will. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. God is good. As we've just partaken of the Lord's Supper, we think about all that God has done for us spiritually. He's taken care of our spiritual needs through his son, Jesus. And as we go to God in prayer at this time, we thank and reflect upon all that he does for us each and every day materially here in this life. Let us bow. Heavenly Father, we approach your holy throne at this time. So thankful, Father, for 
the many blessings materially in this life that you give to us each and every day. We thank you, Father, for your love and for your mercy. We thank you, Father, for the abilities that you've given to us to be able to go out and to work and perform our duties at our jobs and to be able to support our families, all that you do for us and all that you give us, Father. We, we pray that as we give back a portion of that, we pray that, that our hearts are right and that we are giving willingly. We pray that you will accept what we give. And we pray that you will be with, with the men of this congregation as we oversee these funds, Father. We pray that, that these funds will be used in, in a correct way and, and in accordance to your will. Father, continue to bless us as a church and, and be with us each and every day. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Number 285, Zion's Call, number 285. The song before the scripture reading and lesson will be number 275, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? If you will, please stand. We'll sing all four verses. No. like to follow along, we'll be reading Psalms 136, 1 through 4. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures endures forever to him who alone does great wonders for his mercy endures forever certainly glad that you're here this morning and i trust you've got your bibles out and that you're going to use them as we study together play some marker right there at psalm 136 as we'll flip back to that psalm in our study here this morning, uh, this evening, since there's five Sundays this month, uh, Matthew will be preaching tonight, and so that's why there was only one outline in your email this morning, and so uh, come back this evening, and he'll be speaking to us during that, uh, during that hour. Now, Psalm 136 is one of 50 anonymous psalms. Many of the psalms have headings to us that identify 
that it was written by David. Some are even very specific about the time in David's life or some other writer's life in which they were written. But this is one of 50 psalms that there is no heading to that identifies its author. While the author is unknown, I think this is a psalm that we probably could all agree on as to what the theme of the psalm was. If this was a Bible class and I was to ask the question, just scan Psalm 136 and quickly tell me what's the theme of the psalm. If you get the answer wrong, then you haven't looked very closely. Because the, the theme is, is obvious because every single verse ends with some statement. It may differ a little bit on your translation. His loving kindness is everlasting. Or his steadfast love endures forever. Or his mercy endures forever. This is what we call a psalm of thanksgiving. It's often joined with Psalm 135. In fact, there's a lot of similarities between the two. Psalm 135 begins with praise ye, and this psalm begins with give thanks to the Lord. And that's what's emphasized throughout it. It is a psalm of gratitude. And in this psalm, not only does he describe the steadfast love of God, but he gives reasons why we should praise God or give thanks for that steadfast love. What is the steadfast love of God? This is a word that is an important theological word in the Old Testament. In fact, in commenting upon that in the complete Bible library, it says it's one of the most important words in the Hebrew Bible. This word is said, this translated mercy or uh, kindness or uh, steadfast love. And it's used to describe an attribute of God. And it becomes a key theological term for understanding the nature of God as presented in the Old Testament especially in relation to being faithful to covenants and true to his word. It occurs, this particular word does, 127 times in the book of Psalms. 30-something of those, by the way, are right here in Psalm 136. And it's a word that has been variously translated. Mercy and loving kindness by the King James and New King James. Loving kindness by the American Standard. Uh, and it's air the uh, New American Standard, steadfast love in the Revised Standard Version and the NRSV, English Standard Version as well, and simply love by the NIV. And it really is a word that describes, as it relates to God, his actions and how he feels toward individuals. The Theological Dictionary, or the Lexham Theological Workbook, said the core idea of this term relates to loyalty within a relationship. And so it is the idea when we think about this term, it denotes an aspect of God's character as it relates to his people. And the idea of that is of love and of kindness, but not just love, but a love that is steadfast. That's, I like that translation of the particular word. It denotes a loyalty or a, found, or, or a steadfastness. In fact, Lexham says that a good translation would be his loyal love endures forever. And so this idea of this is repeated over and over again is that God loves his people and God is always going to love his people. And God will always act in the best interest of his people. So when you think about this word mercy as it occurs in the King James or the New King James Version, you might just circle that word at least here in Psalm 136 and note that this is a word that has to do with loyalty with steadfastness, with the fact that God's attitude toward his people is not going to change, but it's something that you can rely on. So when we think about the steadfast love of God, what are some evidences of that? And why should I give thanks to God for that enduring and steadfast love? And I think there's some things that we can get out of Psalm 136 and make application to us today in this particular psalm. Well, let's begin by outlining the psalm. Anytime you study a chapter, anytime I study a chapter, we need to begin with an outline after we read through the text that sort of gives us and breaks it down into its constituent parts. What you have in Psalm 136 is, first of all, a summons to praise God for his enduring mercy or steadfast love. Then in 4 to 25, you have examples of that steadfast love. 
And then you have the summons to give thanks reiterated. So if you look at it this way, you've got the first three verses and the last verse are the summons. And 4 to 25, right in the middle, is a psalm or is the reason why God is to be given thanks or evidence of the steadfast love of God. Well, let's talk about God first. Before the psalmist gets into examples, he really just makes a number of points about God and summarizes the character of God that acts on behalf of his people. The first thing he tells us is that God is good. We sing a song sometimes. I think sometimes we think of it almost as a kid song that we sing because kids like to to sing the song. But the song, a very simple one, is God is so good. That's, That's simple, but it's profound. And it's something we need to be reminded of. God is a good God. In fact, in the book of Romans, chapter 11 and in verse 22, the apostle Paul said, Consider therefore both the goodness and the severity of God. God can be good and kind, and he's also severe when man disobeys his word. And we'll see some of those examples of the goodness of God seen throughout this psalm. In Romans 11, by the way, the goodness of God is seen in the fact that he allowed us as wild branches to be grafted into the root and to become part of the people of God. Can you ever thought about that? That he's allowed you, he has allowed me to become part of God's people in spite of the fact that we were not the people of God under the Old Testament. In spite of our sins, God has allowed us through obedience and belief to be grafted in and become part of his people. Indeed, God's good. But not only is God good, he is the God of gods and he is the Lord of lords. One of those statements is made in verse 2 and the other one is made in verse 3. And that is, this God that is good is also a God that is all-powerful. He is in control of everything. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15, he is the only potentate or sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I mean, when I think about God being the God of gods and the Lord of lords, it's even more mind-boggling to me that God is good to me. In Psalm chapter 8, the psalmist raised the question, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visits him? The one that spoke all things into existence the one who is high above the nation, Psalm 113, and in verse uh, 4 through 6, the one who sits on high, the one who in Psalm 115 and verse 3 is in heaven and he does all that he pleases. Nobody can tell God what he can and cannot do. God is so powerful, he does all that he pleases. I don't know how many times through the Bible it'll compare God to idols and point out that an idol can do nothing, God can do everything. Or it compares God to the nations, and the nations are but a drop in the bucket in comparison to God. God is good. He is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, and yet his steadfast love endures forever. That steadfast love and mercy that ultimately will provide for you and I our salvation. And so he begins by saying, give thanks. Who am I giving thanks to? I'm giving thanks to a God that is in control of everything, a God that is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, and yet he is good and he is concerned about me. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the, uh, or the command here to give thanks. Do you think it's possible that we could give too much gratitude to the God that is so good to us? You know, a lot of times we take things for, for granted. Um, we, we, we've been so abundantly blessed in our nation. I think we do take a lot of things for granted. We're coming up on the holiday season. Kids just take for granted. You know what? I'm going to get up and, and Christmas morning, I'm going to have whatever I ask for. It's going to be right there. Somebody's going to give it to me. And uh, sometimes they were taught, some of those that are older, by the way, and talk about how things used to be. And some of the old, I, I've talked to many older people. So I remember at Christmas and I'd get an orange and I'd get this and, and, and grateful to get it. Sometimes we've been so abundantly blessed and we have so much, we're not really as grateful as we need to be for what we do have. And yet the Bible commands us over and again to give thanks to God for all things. Colossians 2 and verse 7, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. I think that verse describes the fact that there's a connection between us being rooted and grounded in God and us being grateful for what God has given to us. There's a connection between gratitude 
and between us having the peace of God. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you are indeed called in one body and be thankful. I mean, you find somebody that's ungrateful. I'll tell you somebody that doesn't really have peace and contentment in this life. And so Ephesians 5 and in verse 20 says that we need to give thanks always for all things. In fact, ingratitude is one of those characteristics of the Gentile world without God. It's listed in the midst of things like homosexuality and adultery and disobedience to parents is ingratitude. And so that tells you something about God's attitude toward that. So this God, I'm going to give thanks to him. Well, what are some of the things I need to give thanks for? Let's talk about the examples of God's enduring mercy. First of all, let me just say God needs to be given thanks for all things because he created all things. Look at verse 4. Do you have your Bible open there? To him alone does great wonders. His steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. For him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. In the psalmist, as he begins, he goes all the way back to the beginning. And he says, remember that God created all things. Him alone does great wonders. And that should be verse 18 of Psalm 72 and not verse 17. But if you look in that verse, Psalm 72 and verse 18, blessed be the God of Israel who alone does wondrous things. Who else could have created this world but God? Who could have spoken into existence except the Lord? In fact, what did he do? By wisdom he made the heaven. You just look at how this world operates. You study science, and I tell you what, you see the wisdom of a creator behind it. As the, the sun, or as the earth rotates around the sun at just the right speed, the revolutions of the earth, everything speaks to the wisdom of a creator. He laid out the earth above the waters, and in verse 6, and he made the great lights. We'll go out and we'll look at the sun, or we go out and we see the beautiful stars at night, and a few things in life are more beautiful than going out and or a beautiful sunset or seeing the moon and it's full and it's brightness. And he's saying God is the one that put all of that into place. This is not a science lesson, but if you study science, you realize that the earth is just the right distance from the sun. If it was just a little bit further away, life would be impossible. If it was just a little bit closer, everything would be burned up. You see the wisdom of God and, and the creation that is all around us. And I think one thing that that reminds me of, and he was reminding Israel of, is there are things that I take for granted day in and day out that are provided for me by the steadfast love of God. I mean, there, there are things that we daily take for granted. Uh, we, we get up in the morning and we see that the sun came. I mean, we've got people here of all kinds of ages. I don't know who the oldest person is here. But those that have been around for 80 plus years, you get up every morning. You know what's happened for every morning, for 80 something morning, the sun has come up. And what happens is the rain falls. And it provides the, the ability for crops to grow and for us to have, have food. Uh, the Bible talks about, by the way, rain is a blessing from God. You remember in the book of Matthew chapter 5, he causes the rain to fall what? On the just and on the unjust. There are things that we take for granted day in and day out that are provided by God that make our life possible and make our life enjoyable. In fact, in Acts 17, 24 to 28, we talked about that just this last Sunday or this last Wednesday night where the Apostle Paul in Athens is preaching and he says, let me tell you about who the real God is. The unknown God is the one who made the world and everything in it. And he goes on to describe the fact he's the one in whom we live and move and have our very being. He's the God that you need to be concerned about. He's the God that you need to worship. So when I think about examples of the steadfast love of God, 
I find it interesting that the psalmist starts back at creation. If this was a Bible class and I was to ask the question, an example of God's steadfast love, there's no doubt that first and foremost in our minds would be the deliverance from sin and the hope of heaven and all those things we're going to get to in Psalm 136. But don't ever take for granted the ordinary things of life that God has provided for us for which we need to give things. But I'll tell you what, not only does he talk about him creating all things, he delivered his people from bondage. Go back to Psalm 136. And notice what he did here in Psalm 136. He delivered his people from Egyptian bondage. He struck down the firstborn of Egypt for his steadfast love endures forever. He brought Israel out from among them for his steadfast love endures forever. With strong hand and outstretched arm, his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever. He made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever. And he overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. Going back to the history of the nation of Israel, he reminds them of their deliverance from Egyptian bondage. You read about that bondage in Exodus 1. Uh, by the time the people of Israel had left, they forgot a little bit about how bad that bondage was. But you read in Exodus 1 about how badly they were treated, how their, their, their children, their male children were being killed. Moses had to be, to be hit how they were increasing the quota of bricks that they had to produce in order to avoid punishment. And, and then they made them gather the straw and the materials as well as keeping up the quota of bricks or there would be a severe penalty attached to it. You may remember the thing that led Moses into the land of Midian is he, had to, he killed an Egyptian because he saw him be uh, an Israelite. And so you, you see that... The, the, the mistreatment and how they, they suffered in Exodus chapter 1 and what God did for them is he caused the miracle of that tenth plague. He caused ten in all. The tenth one is mentioned here. He struck the firstborn. That was the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, we would say, when finally Pharaoh said, I've had enough. Go, leave. And, of course, they, they, they began their journey right into the Red Sea. It's not the, the place that you would have picked out the people of Israel would have been cornered there and Pharaoh went after them. And yet he divided the Red Sea and he allowed them to pass through. And then when the Pharaoh's army went into the midst of the Red Sea, he closed it back up and that enemy was defeated. And never again did they have to worry about Pharaoh coming after them and taking them back to Egyptian bondage. You would have thought, by the way, with that kind of deliverance, they would have been grateful. And yet, what the Bible tells us about that in Exodus chapter 10 and verse 10 is it wasn't very long till they grumbled and some of them were destroyed by the destroyer. In Exodus 16 and in verse 3, they said, all that we had just died in the land of Egypt. You remember how much food we had? How oh, things were so wonderful there. And they thought all the way, I forgot all about that bondage of Exodus 1. Well, that's an important lesson to learn about how God delivered his people. But I want you to make an application of that you will. What is the evidence of the steadfast love of God? And that is, just like he delivered the people from bondage there, he's also delivered us from a harsh and oppressive bondage. You know what kind of bondage you were in? You were in the bondage of sin. In John 8, 31 through 34, you may remember how the Lord had said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And for some reason, that deeply offended the, uh, offended the Jews who said, we're Abraham's children, and we've never been in bondage to anyone. And the Lord responded, that most assuredly I say unto you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. In Acts 8 and verse 23, after Simon the sorcerer tried to buy the gift of God with money, the apostle Peter told him, you are in the, bond, you're in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. That is, you are in the bondage of sin. Do you know what Jesus God did for you? He gave His only begotten Son. He sent His Son to give His life so that you could be saved. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Christ has set you free. Galatians 5 and verse 1 said, For freedom Christ has set us free. Why be entangled again with the yoke of bondage? 
Not only did he send his son, he gave us a message, a pretty simple message to obey. And when we obey from the heart that former doctrine that's been delivered to us, we're set free from sin and we become servants of righteousness. He provided a second law of pardon for me. I mean, you and I, if we looked at somebody that's a slave and they get their freedom, and then after they get their freedom, they turn right back around and they sell themselves back right back into slavery, we'd probably say, well, I don't feel sorry for them. They had their freedom and yet they went right back. And yet you and I have done that. We accept the freedom from sin and then we sin again and we find ourselves right back in the bondage we got out of. That was the case with Simon the sorcerer. And yet God has provided a second opportunity for me and a third opportunity and on. In Acts 8, he said, pray to God that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. And once again, we have that freedom from the bondage of sin. My question for you, you want to think about the steadfast love of God. It is seen in the freedom he gave the people of Israel. But that freedom in many ways is a foreshadowing of the freedom that you and I receive from sin. Are you grateful? Do you give God thanks repeatedly for his steadfast love? 2 Peter 1 and verse 9 talks about those that are short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. Does that characterize you? Are you one who are giving thanks to God for his steadfast love? What did God do? He created all things. Things we take for granted day in and day out are evidence of God's love. He offered them freedom from bondage, but he did the same thing for you and I. And he gave his people the promised land. I'll not take time right now to read through all of verse 16 through verse 24. But he describes there how he led them through the wilderness. And he struck down kings like Sihon and Og and ultimately gave their land as a heritage to them. And all of that was done because his steadfast love endures forever. I mean, you think about what God did for Israel. He led them through the wilderness. He led them and he provided for them. He he gave them everything they needed to get through that wilderness. He provided them water, sometimes in the way they wanted, sometimes in other ways. He provided them, uh, made bitter water sweet. He gave water from a rock at least on two occasions. He gave them manna that fell down from, from heaven in order to get them through the wilderness. He gave them quail to eat when they complained about the bread. He gave them uh, meat to eat and the quail. He gave them shoes and clothes, or made their shoes and clothes, not wear out at all, even though for 40 years they would wander in the wilderness because of the sin of that first generation. God led them through the wilderness, and he guided them in the way they should go with a cloud over their head uh, by day and a cloud and a pillar of fire by, by night. He struck down the great kings in front of them. Any obstacle that was in their way, God was with them and he gave them victory over men like Sihon and Og who were giants in the land. And not only did he strike, strike down the kings, he gave them their land as a heritage and brought it in. They defeated all those kings and they dwelt in the land and they enjoyed the bounty of vineyards they hadn't planted. They lived in houses they hadn't built and drank water from... Uh, from wells that they hadn't dug. God abundantly blessed these people and said, it's yours forever if you'll just simply obey me. And they didn't do that. He rescued them from all of their enemies. And instead of being grateful, they forgot. Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, they served God all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. But then after them, the Bible said, there arose a generation that knew not God nor the things which he had done for Israel. And it's no wonder that you see what happened in the book of Judges because once they forgot about what God had done for them, they weren't grateful. And once they lost that gratitude, there was no reason to serve the Lord. Let's see if we can make some application to us. You think there's any parallel for you and I today as we think about what God has provided for us? And that is that God offers us the promised land of heaven. Hebrews chapter five and uh, 4 and verse 9 reminds us that, that the Canaan rest was not the ultimate rest for the people of God. And that's why in Hebrews 5, uh, 4 and verse 9, he said, so then therefore remains a rest for the people of God. Let me just say this. I don't have all this on the church. You know what God's done for us? God has given us everything we need to get through this wilderness that we're in. He's given us his word to guide us. 
to tell us how we need to live. It gives us all things that pertains unto life and to godliness. There's not a thing that I need that God is not. He's provided for me everything I need spiritually. He's even promised me that if I'll serve him, he'll give me all that I need materially. He has promised me that I can defeat any enemy that stands in my way. Uh, I can, if I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, he's given me the weaponry that I need to defeat all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And the principalities and the powers and the heavenly places can't stand up against God's people if they properly rely on the Lord and put their faith in Him. Just like the people. He's told me, I've given you everything you need in order to defeat the enemies that are before you. And I will not allow you to face anything that you can't overcome. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he said, No temptation has taken you, but such is common to man... And God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So just like the people of Israel that God guided in the wilderness gave them victory over their enemies if they did what God said to do, God has done the same thing for me spiritually. And ultimately, He has said that He will provide for us this land of rest. Think of that's the Lord's 1, 7. You know, the Bible says that sometimes there are troubles that come here life. And yet, 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8 said, He'll come and give you that are troubled rest. Rest from what? Rest from tribulation, rest from temptation, rest from affliction. All those kind of rest will be provided for us. It is going to be a late place of joy. How many times <coughs> does the Bible make a statement like, enter into the joy of your Lord or your Master? A place where He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and there's no mourning or no sorrow for all those former things have passed away. Eternal life to those who uh, serve Him. A place where we can worship God through all eternity around the throne. A place where we receive an immortal body. I don't know what my body is going to be like, but I tell you, it's not going to be this body. This body is not going to be the body I have. And sometimes I tell you, as people get older, they sort of get tired of the body as it begins to wear down, as it begins to betray them, as they begin to deal with pain and discomfort. And yet, there come a time in which what this mortal body will put on immortality. And I don't know what it's going to be like, but to be like the Lord's, and that's enough for me. Philippians 1, 20 and 21. A place where we already said there's no crying and there's no sin there. No no turning on the news and seeing what's the latest mistake that's that's characterizing our our people or or, or what's the latest tragedy that's taking place. All those things have passed away. And here God is saying, this can be yours. You know what that's proof of? Of the steadfast love of God. That he's provided for you and me not only the opportunity to escape the bondage of sin, not only do I enjoy the creation that's all around me, I have the opportunity to go to heaven and to be with him through all eternity, be with people of a like mind through all eternity, and never shed another tear, never see any more death, and never see any more pain. And then finally in verse 25, I think as he brings this to a close, he does remind us as well that in addition to the creation that's around us and the deliverance, he gives gives food to all flesh, he said in verse 29. Our 25. And that is, when we think about our blessings, first and foremost, we have to think about, we have to think about our spiritual blessings. But when you think about the steadfast love of God, don't forget your material things either. Uh, most of us, the biggest problem we face when it comes to what we eat is deciding what to eat. I mean, th- th- there are people here, I'm sure, that have lived through times that are more difficult than that. When you had to decide what kind of dry bean do I want? You know, because money may have been... Most of us have been blessed. And the biggest decision we make is, what are we going to eat? What restaurant do we want to go to? What do we want to order? And and, and my point is that sometimes we take for granted the fact that when we go to a place and we order food and it's brought to us, you know who provides that for us? You know where that came from? It came from the hand of God. God is the source of all our material blessings. That's why in 1 Timothy 6, or 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17... He said to remind those that are rich in this present age not to be haughty, 
nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly gives us all things to enjoy or provides us with everything to enjoy. Everything you have came from the hand of God. Food in many ways is representative of those blessings. I think when the Lord says that we are uh, with food and clothing, with these to be content, those two things are represented by what we need. And I think food here, God has given us materially everything that we need. When we give thanks for our daily bread, why do I do that? Hopefully it's not a matter, like we talked about in Isaiah this morning, of mere rote, but it's a reminder. When I sit down at the table and I enjoy a meal, I'm enjoying that meal because God gave it to me. And that's evidence of the steadfast mercy of God. And that's why the Bible says, by the way, that we need to give thanks in all things. And nothing's to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. And after going through all of that and reminding the people of Israel, listen, you've got a lot to be thankful for. Look at the examples of God's love for you. It has never changed. It has been steadfast from the time he created this world to the time he brought you out of Egyptian bondage to the bringing you into the promised land and to enjoying all the food that you enjoy right now. The steadfast love of God has never changed. And so you know what he does in verse 26? He comes back and he said, Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. Are you giving thanks for God's steadfast love? Are there things that we have that we just are sort of taken for granted and we just need to get back and remember where all of those blessings come from? We've been abundantly blessed. Give thanks to the Lord. Number 285, Zion's call. When we sing that song, it'll be the proper time for one that needs to respond in obedience to the gospel. You're not a Christian, become one this very morning by being buried in the waters of baptism. Or maybe there's somebody here that's obeyed and wandered away from the Lord and needs to come back. No matter what your, oppor- uh, your need is, this may be the only opportunity that you have. We're not assured of any other. So why not take advantage of it? Why not respond right now, even as we stand and we sing? this morning. Hope you'll make plans to be back with us this evening at 5 o'clock as we study from another portion of God's Word. We'll close with number 66. 
God bless you. Go with God. No, so me. This is my daily prayer. God bless you. Go with God. Hold fast his mighty hand throughout the day. His grace your heart sustain. His power relieve your pain. Your prayer be not in vain. As you travel His way, in spite of all the lies that some may hurl, Christ is the Please bow with me as we're dismissed. Our Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we come before you to close this service. Father, giving thanks for the day and for the opportunity we've had to come together this morning and study thy word. And we pray that all was said and done was in accordance to your will and that you'd be with us, Father, as we go throughout our lives, that we may seek our best to serve you, Father. We th are thankful for all of our blessings, both spiritual and physical, Father, and the love that you have shown to us. And Father, we know that there are those in this number who are dealing with difficult times, whether it be illness or loss of loved ones or whatever it may be, Father, and pray that you'd be with them and give them strength and help them to, through their journeys, Father. There's also, at the time of the year, Father, there's those who are traveling, and we just ask that you'd be with them and give them safety, and pray that you'd be with us as we go out to the world, that we would be a shining light and a good example to others, and that things that we do and things that we say would hopefully bring others to you, Father. We ask that you'd forgive us of all of our sins and help us to put, put you first in our lives. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.